morning, everyone. Our call to worship. When the sun rises, what shall we sing? My soul magnifies the Lord. And when chaos and violence echo on the screen, my soul magnifies the Lord. For our God is God is a God of justice and peace. My soul magnifies the Lord. So when all is wrong or all is right, my soul magnifies the Lord. Yes, when all is wrong or all is right, we will sing with joy and delight of the God of justice and love and peace. My soul magnifies the Lord. Our prayer of praise and adoration. God of Advent joy, our souls magnify you and our spirits rejoice in you, our Savior. Look with favor upon us as we gather to worship you. Stir our hearts to fill, you, to fill with mirth and our lips to sing with praise for the joy that you are bringing to your people. Amen. <music> Third week of Advent, joy. We light candles of hope, peace, joy, and love, remembering the promises of God with prayer. We light this candle in hope. We light this candle for peace. We light this candle with joy. This week, we light this candle of joy to remind us that darkness does not have the last word. Please join me on the bold. May this light guide and inspire us as we work to spread God's joy and delight. God of promise, God of hope, into our darkness come. Amen.
The psalmist says, happy are those who trust in God. Therefore, with trusting and open hearts, let us approach God as we confess our sins together. Please join me. God of joy, we are thirsty for your grace. You made a way for us in the wilderness, and still in our foolishness we go astray. We hide our eyes from your presence. We do not listen to your word. We are lifeless when we ought to dance with joy, and speechless when we ought to sing praise. Forgive us, O Lord. Speak peace into our fearful hearts. Strengthen our weak hands and make firm our feeble knees as we seek to follow in your holy way. Amen. Now return to the Lord with joy and happiness. Sing a song of redemption. Let sorrow and sighing be no more. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Our prayer for illumination. The prophet says that we will draw water with rejoicing from the springs of salvation. May your word to us today be that water, nourishing us to the joyful receiving of your scripture. Through your Holy Spirit, may this saving spring come to us and wash us with the wisdom of your word. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from Isaiah, the 35th chapter, verses 1 through 10. The wilderness and the wasteland shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice, even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it. The excellence of Carmel and Sharon, they shall see the glory of the Lord. The, excell the excellency of our God. Strengthen the weak hands, the feeble knees. Say to those who are fearful, fearful hearted, be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. The lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For the waters shall burst in the wilderness, and the streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land of springs of water, in the habitation of jackals, where each lay. There shall be grass, and make firm with reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and a road, and it shall be called Highway of Holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not stray. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast go upon it. It shall not be there, and the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. With everlasting joy on their heads, they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Our second reading comes from the New Testament, Luke, the first chapter, verses 39 through 55. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to the city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should, should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly state of his maid servant. For behold, henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, 
and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. The bells of the church steeples have always called us, called us away from what we're doing into something else, called us away from the things that we're wrapped up in and called us to pay attention to God. But just hearing them off in the distance, people used to hear them and stop and come to gather. Ironically, our hours are now filled with different kinds of bells. We've got alarm clocks, we've got rings calling us to pay attention to business that needs to happen, or rings that tell us to answer the phone, maybe rings that tell you to check your notifications, maybe you're responding to an email, or seeing what message you missed. But the bells of the church have always called us away from such things to the very foundation of our lives, to the joy that we find in the steadfast love of God. As we lit the candle of joy this morning with its bright pink glow amongst all the rest of the purple of Advent, it might call us away from other things in our lives and point us towards something, towards joy in the midst of this season. Preacher William Sloan Coffin writes, why are Christians often so joyless? I think it's because they only have enough religion to make them miserable. Guilt they know, but not forgiveness. And so what if this time, this week, especially in the middle of Advent, we recapture some of that Advent joy? Advent beckons us away from everything else that's going on in our lives to right there in front of us, remember that God's grace comes to us wherever we are. We don't find much help in John the Baptist though. He's not a rosy optimist. He was rarely probably the most positive person in the room. There was always an edge to his words. John would have had a tough time getting a job writing Hallmark Christmas cards. And you can almost imagine like the front of his card saying, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and then opening it up on the inside and saying, you brood of vipers. No, John was not an optimist. And so he looked around the world and he saw that there were a whole lot of things that were not the way that they should have been. And that's the reason why love and joy comes to us at Christmas, because the world isn't quite right. So when people gathered around John and his time to be baptized by John, he speaks a different word to them. He says, everyone who has two coats must share with the one who has one, and whoever has food must do likewise. And to the tax collector, he says this, collect no more than the amount prescribed. And to the soldiers, he says this, do not extort money from anyone by threat or false accusation. John was not just concerned about people being baptized. He was concerned with the needs of the world. And he told each of these different groups how to make those changes happen around them. John fervently talked about the needs of others. He wanted them to be treated fairly and with dignity and respect. But that also meant that John was rarely probably satisfied with the status quo. And if John didn't understand anything, it probably meant that he didn't understand joy. He had this discontentment within him. But maybe he was really trying to describe something that was more akin to a dissatisfaction because he knew that joy could be found, but it just wasn't quite there yet. I'm sure all of us could think of stories of our own lives of when we've experienced the most deepest joy. And sometimes those are in the midst of hard times as well. 
But it's those moments, whether we've been given extreme acts of kindness and generosity from someone else, or, or maybe it's someone who's done that for you, or maybe it's when your child was born. There's all of these moments that are mixed up with joy, as well as the, ah, oh, it could be so great. But joy is the most obvious sort of um, feeling and emotion at this time, especially in Christmas. But so many times we have this image of joy having to be like everything perfect, everything in this sort of hallmark, picturesque sort of moment. But then when you peel away the veneer, it's not quite perfect, is it? But I think we can still have joy in the midst of all of that, even when things aren't picture perfect. At Christmas time in my house, when I think about joy, I think about getting out the box of Christmas books that we've read. We've read them with each of our kids and now our oldest is in high school, our middle child is in middle school and our youngest is in elementary school. But I never get tired of reading some of those stories. Some of our favorites are The Grinch Who Stole Christmas and Twice the Night Before Christmas, Christmas Carol, Christmas Cricket, and God Gave Us Christmas, as told by the polar bears. I love the pictures in these stories. You know, you've got the, the tree that's decorated and the lights are twinkling. You know, maybe you've got the picture in the book of kids laying out cookies for Santa. All of these are picture perfect moments, but that's not the reality, is it? In my house, Dogs and cats don't have red bows on them. They tore those off their collars like several minutes ago. The Christmas tree always leans slightly and if you get a little too close to it, you might knock it over. And I still cannot find the hanger for the wreath for the front door. Interestingly, there was a children's book illustrator um, by the name of Peter, uh, Peter Spire he never had a perfect Christmas, and yet his illustrations are these quintessential Christmas moments. You see, when Peter was growing up, he was raised as Jewish. Right around the time of World War II, his entire family was taken to concentration camps. He didn't make it back until 1945 into Amsterdam. But he illustrates these sort of picture-perfect moments. It's almost like he imagines a time and a place that's untouched by the harsh realities of life. But perhaps joy is more resilient than pain. The Apostle Paul says, rejoice always. But he doesn't say, rejoice when everything is perfect. No. We can do this. We can rejoice by letting our gentleness be known. We can respond to the harshness in this world with the gentleness of Christ. We can do this by giving away one coat when we have two, like John suggested. We can protect others who are being taken advantage of. We can treat everyone with kindness and fairness and compassion. And that's showing and experiencing the joy of Christ in the midst of everything that is not quite right. There was a man by the name of Ken Parker, and you might have read about him in a newspaper about a year or two ago. During the summer of 2017, he traveled to Charlottesville, Virginia, and he was going to a rally called Unite the Right. He was a former Grand Dragon of the KKK, and yet he had joined a neo-Nazi group because the KKK wasn't conservative enough, wasn't, they didn't go far enough. And so he went to this rally, number one, wanting to stand up for white supremacy, but also because he had hopes of starting a race war. So in that year, in the year in between, everything changed in his life. You see, he met a man by the name of William McKinnon III. And William McKinnon is a pastor of All Saints Holiness Church in Jacksonville, Florida. And he happens to be a neighbor of Ken Parker. See, McKinnon is an African-American pastor. And yet, despite everything that Ken Parker believed 
and his horrific views and all of the things that he said, McKinnon treated him with gentleness and kindness and compassion. And over the course of a year, he dismantled Parker's worldview. That summer, in the summer of August of 2018, a year after he was going to this conference, this rally, McKinnon baptized Parker as a member of his mostly African-American congregation. That's the joy of Christ. That's the joy of Christ bursting into a situation where everything looks hopeless, where everything is not quite right with the world. But joy doesn't pretend that those things don't exist. Joy exists undeterred. The Bible never says this explicitly, but I tend to imagine Jesus traveling around with the disciples around the time of his ministry. You know, there were nights where they had places to stay, and then there were nights where maybe they camped on the hillside. There were nights where they probably had food, and there were nights where they probably didn't. You, know, you can imagine the disciples going around picking up firewood and maybe another one lighting the fire and, and helping cook some, some food. Maybe you can imagine them sitting there under the starry sky and, and talking about what happened during that day. They probably talked about the things that they had seen that day. You know, the things that were not quite right with the world. They saw folks that were hungry. They saw people who were ill and sick. They saw people who were hurting. They saw people that were ignored and pushed out on the margins. And I imagine that there were other moments where they told stories again about what they had seen. Wonderful moments, life shared. You know, maybe you can imagine Jesus laughing at some of those things. Because in the midst of life, things can also be quite beautiful. And I can imagine Jesus sitting there enjoying life with his disciples taking solace in those friendships and savoring the joy that they had together. As we draw near to God in this season, in the midst of life that is normal and life that is not quite normal and not quite right, know that God draws near to us in the middle of all of that. And so as we wait for the birth of Jesus and we wait during this Advent time, Reclaim, let us reclaim the joy of Christ that comes into the midst of this world. Amen. Our introduction to the offering. Rejoice in God, we offer you thanks and praise for this season of anticipation, this season of Advent. 
As we prepare for the birth of your son, we share our tithes and our offering with the joy and excitement that is common as one anticipates the birth of a new child. Bless these gifts in your holy name. Amen. Our prayer of thanksgiving. Eternal God, as we wait for the fulfillment of your reign, use these gifts and the gifts of our lives to bring justice to those who are oppressed, to set the captives free, to lift up those who are bowed down, and to fill the hungry with good things. Give us the wisdom to be faithful stewards of your gifts and the strength to be holy instruments of your love and grace that all may know joy. Amen. If you'll bow your heads in prayer with me as we pray for the world. Gracious God, we ready ourselves for the coming of the Savior. We seek to prepare our hearts to receive him once again by doing our best to live out this gospel in a world in need. We seek you out in times of certainty and abundance, and also in times of doubt and famine. We sometimes give in to fear. We sometimes let ourselves depend on the work of our hands more than we would care to admit. But you're there to guide us back to you. In trust, we lift up those things that are on our hearts and those that are spoken here today. Guide us to walk in the steps of Jesus and how we nurture each other and ourselves in Christ's example. We seek you out, O King of Joy, but the world is much more complex. This is a world where we're taught to rely upon ourselves, to despair when all doesn't go our way, to hide ourselves when there's times that are challenging. You came to bring us joy and allow that joy to spur us on to bring joy to the entire world. Creation resounds with that calling, but because we're complicated human beings, we struggle. We do not praise you by taking care of your creation. Instead, we abuse it we don't worship you by living into the example of Jesus and caring for our neighbors, both near and far. We blame them for issues they can't control. Guide us to live into the difficulties of life that proclaim joy, while also recognizing that joy for the world is not yet complete. You ask many things of us, O oh God, but we know that we will never be alone to do your work in this world. And we pray that these things, in the name of joy incarnate, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our benediction today is to be people of joy. Let joy live in your heart and share the joy of Christ with all whom you meet. Share joy by remembering good times and hoping for good times yet to come. Share joy by praying for our world. In Advent, 
We need to see and feel and hear and share joy. So as you go, wonder at all of God's creation. Share joy and peace and hope with all those whom you meet and speak with. Amen. And may the peace of Christ be with you and also with you.